Welcome to the second talk in this series. Uh, the, like my first talk, this will be of a tutorial nature. And uh, as Anurak already uh, mentioned, this, this will be an introduction into what can you do at home with tabletop spectroscopy? How do you write a propelling or a very compelling uh, beam time proposal? And how do you uh, work on making the resources we have used in the most efficient way? Um, I will show a little less active science, but more really as a tutorial part. But maybe let's start first with myself. And uh, I'm uh, originally studied in Jena in Germany uh, on uh, thin film technology, uh, growing thin films, analyzing them. Uh, then I went uh, to uh, Imuno, did some surface spectroscopy, came to Lund uh, in 2006, so it's now 14 years, and uh, started to build tabletop spectrometers and uh, started to ultra-fast uh, time resolved spectroscopy. Uh, then uh, I went for a postdoc to uh, NIST in Colorado, uh, in uh, in US, uh, again continuing with tabletop spectroscopy, uh, a postdoc in uh, Grenoble at the ESF uh, synchrotron uh, facility as a visiting scientist, uh, beamline scientist, and then came back to Lund, continuing with tabletop spectroscopy, time resolved spectroscopy, and now really mostly working on time resolved uh, parts. In this talk today, I really would like to introduce you what can you do in uh, tabletop setups and why should you use them. So as a motivation, I will not really go into the science, which I have done in my last talk, but as a motivation, I will tell you what are actually the limitations of large-scale facilities uh, if you want to use large-scale facilities. For me, as a scientist, there are three major limitations which I like to address or try to address with tabletop uh, projects. One is the time it takes. Uh, for doing uh, experiments or before I can do an experiment. So I have to prepare the proposal, the beam time, which is a part. I have to assemble a team, in particular for time resolved experiments. This can be more than 10 people. So I need to collaborate with other groups. I need to find collaborations. I need to, after data collection, I need to analyze a large amount of data, which takes multiple men years of work uh, to really get through those ones. And most important, it's the time it takes before I can do my experiments. So waiting time from the announcement of the call when I prepare my proposal until I have done my beam time and have my data, not until it's analyzed, but until I get my data, is typically from half a year up to two a year. And this was all before COVID-19. Now I got quite some few of my own beam times canceled. So this time extends. So this is obviously one time where I can really speed up with having something in the lab. Second, it's the risk and the efforts I need to put into a proposal. I need to write the proposal and I will motivate why this is actually quite some work. This is, uh, can be up to a week for a good time resolved proposal. For steady state, it's not quite as much. I have to prepare the beam time. And if I write a proposal, I also risk, because it's a peer view, uh, I risk that these ideas are actually out. So the hottest ideas is a bit challenging. Second prepared is the efforts in preparation. For example, for time resolved proposals, I need to prepare samples for about one week of beam time or multiple days. This can be one gram of a very rare molecule. And if I, like in my case, work on uh, rare organometallic complexes, uh, we produce roughly 20 milligrams per week per person. That means this is a significant effort to actually produce enough samples for beam time. Now, the difference at a large scale facility is that usually I need to have enough sample for the whole beam time. So I need to guess how good is my sample? Do I have sample? Do I have damage? So I need to have enough sample for the whole beam time. In the lab, I can run the small batches, try it and test it again. Next, there is no guarantee of success of a proposal. If your proposal is good, of course you have a good rate and I have an excellent uh, track record, but if the proposal, uh, you cannot guarantee it. So if you uh, apply for grants, that's a risk, uh, a risk factor which you need to account for. Lastly, it's the costs. Now these are poor guesses taken from the budgets and uh, uh, I'm very well aware this can be off by a factor of two or three, but still a time resolved experiment, for example, at a next fell, uh, the cost for my personal group is if I have to finance 10 people for one week in the US, that's about 40,000 euros. Um, the facility costs are even higher. And this is as taken from the budget. And uh, one can estimate roughly two, 
two to three million euros for a beam time. Um, for a beam time in a normal synchrotron, it's not quite as much. For my own group, it's four people for one week, so not too much. But for the facility, it's still a significant amount of money. Now, this is not really to uh, scare. You don't have to pay this. This is paid by the taxpayer. But the importance of it is that your proposal needs to reflect this. So a unit proposal needs to be good enough to really for, the, uh, for us as society to finance this proposal. And this puts a real limitation on the science you can actually do. That means the science I'm proposing for the beam time, there has to be a success. I have to est uh, estimate that there's, this beam time will be successful. So this will be not the most risky uh, experiments I do, but this will be experiments which are somewhere in between, in the balance. And typically, as I said, that you do some part is risky, some part is not risky, but it really doesn't uh, push me to the edge of the science. And this is where really the uh, uh, lab-based equipment can come and help because with the lab-based equipment, I can rule out quite a lot of the risks. I can do pre-experiments, I can study the most uh, burning experiments at home and then write a really propelling proposal for the large-scale facilities and go much better prepared to the facilities and make this investment really worth it. So that's why we're going to look into time uh, into lab-based equipments and lab-based setups today. Let's look back. What interactions do we have? This is back from my last talk. And today, I really want to focus on the spectroscopy. So the incoming photons are absorbed, and I probe the density of empty states with Xanes or Xas, and I probe the density of filled states with XES. For this, I send in light of variable wavelengths, and you're going to see that there is a difference between uh, beam times or beam line uh, or large scale facility experiments and lab based experiments. The major difference is really on the sources you are using. Because these sources where you have bending magnets, undulators, and wigglers, or even uh, resonant for felts, uh, those ones, there are very few setups where you could do this in your lab, but typically what you have is you have an, uh, an uh, X-ray tube where you have an acceleration of an, uh, of an electron with a voltage, which is then stopped uh, at, at the material. So we're going to focus today on X-ray tubes. X-ray tubes produce two types of radiation. One is, of course, the characteristic radiation, which is really a, a particular to the element. The second one is a very broad radiation. What is nice? The radiation is proportional to the numbers of electrons you're sending in, and it is proportional to the uh, element you're using for stopping the electrons. The real limitation is actually the melting, <laughs> or is the, is the heat, because you're actually putting a significant amount of current in a very small region. Small region is important, for example, if you do imaging, because the spot size is your resolution. Again, from my last talk, the bigger the spot size, the more blurry the resolution. And this is uh, pertinent for both the imaging, but also for spectroscopy. So the numbers of photons you can put in the small, or the numbers of electrons you can put on a very small spot size is limited, which means that the flux you can actually get out of it in X-ray tube or of a uh, tube source like this is limited. Now, these are numbers uh, I've taken from, from a paper, which I'm gonna cite in a second. And, uh, but this is uh, uh, roughly the integrated flux the integrated flux in the line, but also the integrated flux over the whole broadband radiation. Those sources can be big, but they can also be small. This is the source I'm using most often in my lab, about 15 centimeters. They can be fairly handy. Um, the challenge with it is that this flux is, if it's in the line, it's perfect for imaging. If, it's, uh, if you do spectroscopy with it, it is distributed over a very wide range. Now, in comparison to underlighters or large facilities, there the flux is in a very narrow range. That means the photons per second, per millimeter, per, uh, per most, uh, opening angle or per divergence, and per energy is significantly higher for undulators. But this means that you have to be in a more clever design how you design your experiments. Now this number we're going to come back to in a second. So the question is, how do you use those photons which you generate with the lab-based equipment. Now those sources are steady state. I come from a time-resolved field, so I built myself a time-resolved source working in the same principle. For me, I use a laser 
focus it on a water jet, produce an electric field, accelerate electrons, get the same kind of broad Bremsstrahlung spectrum with a very similar numbers of photons. Now this is per percent bandwidth. If you put this per EV, this is roughly the same. So we have the same order of magnitude and we have a small little setup. So the clue or the key of using those type of setups is just the detection. Now there are three different types of detectors in general, and we're going to go through each of those. Number one, I want to go to our energy dispersive detectors. Energy dispersive detectors take the photon energy, ion, um, absorb the photon, produce one fast electron, and then you can do a lot of different things with the electron. Classically, in an ion chamber, for example, you can shoot those photons into a gas, you produce your ions or, and your electrons, and then you can accelerate them. The first, if you put too little voltage for the acceleration, they be combined, nothing happens. In the next range, you get a proportional, you, uh, you extract all the electrons you have or all the charges you have one by one. So one photon, one electron. In the next range, you can uh, magnify this to a certain intensity. Typically, that's just a magnification factor of below 200 which you then read out. And if you have a Geiger counter where you do the typical click per photon. So in those ranges, what you do is you count photons, you count how many photons are coming. There's a second way how we can use direct detection is that the single photon, you put, uh, the single ion or electron you're producing is high energetic. So afterwards, there's a cascade when the electron is moving through the material and can produce further electrons. I can in, in, indeed uh, produce a whole bunch of electrons, typically about 2000 electrons in silicon for a 6 kV photon. Now there's a nice uh, paper where this is produced. Um, you can do this in a, a silicon drifted uh, diet and extract, for example, 2000 electrons for one photon, a different energy of the photon would produce a different number. And the height of the signal getting out of here is an, uh, an indication or is a number for how much energy did the photon have. Now, in the CCD, for example, if you would use the CCD, it works in a very similar way. You have a depth, a zone where it's a depletion. The charge is generated. You generate your charge cloud. You can suck it. Uh, you can uh, transfer this into a transfer channel or into, uh, into the transfer channel. And from there on, you can read it out for each pixel. As you can see here, each pixel is now its own diode or its own detector. If you analyze the numbers of electrons or the signal you're getting out of there, you can get a spectrum, which is limited by the uh, numbers of electrons, by the statistics behind of it. And this is a fairly nice spectrum. The advantage of it is that you have a very broad range. You have a huge area of a detector, which is really close to your source. It's very high quantum efficiency. It's relatively cheap and you can Practically, for example, collect up to 10% of all photons emitted from a source. If you look, for example, for XAS, you can count how many photons do you have. You can retrieve the energy of a single photon and then do a statistics, make a spectrum from there. Uh, you might have to model the details. And for pulse sources, you can use an array detector like a CCD. Uh, my thesis actually summarizes a lot of those parts uh, quite interestingly. The challenge, however, is that this cascade in what you produce the signal from which you get this wide bandwidth, which is really nice and linear, is limited by how many particles do you produce. In silicon, for example, this is about 2000 electrons for six, uh, a 6 kV photon uh, because of the band gap of silicon. Now, to overcome this limitation, because these numbers of electrons limit the resolution you can get, and as I have shown in the previous slide, the resolution is about 100 dV. So this is fully sufficient to do uh, XRF, to analyze how many materials you have, and very nice to have actually in the lab. It's also very nice to analyze the spectrum of your source. That's my source spectrum as a broadband, but it's not really enough to make high resolution science. For this, was a new, very relatively new development, which is the cryogenic, uh, cryogenic uh, X-ray detection, for example, with a whole bunch of different detectors. I'm quite active in this field. There's four different kinds. I will focus on two. In one, for example, you generate a uh, tunneling junction 
where you have a superconductor, an insulator in the superconductor, photons uh, coming in produce again your bunch of electrons. The electrons that are now generated in this insulator or can tunnel through this insulator band gap. And from the numbers of uh, electrons which can tunnel through here, again, you can extract the uh, photon uh, energy. The key is that this uh, generation is now significantly limited or your band gap is limited as not 1.1 dB, but typically of the order of a few tens of milli electron volts, meaning that you get significantly more particles per photon, better statistics, better resolution. The second family is the thermal family, where you absorb a photon, have a tiny piece of metal, the piece of metal heats up, you measure the temperature of this metal, this is actually for mega electron volts, how this literally looks like, this is your absorber, your temperature is down here, you can make an array of these parts. Now, instead of having looking on the charge, which is a fraction, you uh, convert this charge into heat and measure the heat of the total photons. What you measure then is for each photon arriving is a rise in the fall of the temperature. That's a measurement, not a simulation, for different photon energies. From the integral below here, you can extract what was the photon energy. And from this, you can uh, build a statistic. The thermometer you're using needs to be, of course, very sensitive. It needs to measure one millikelvin temperature changes. We use a superconducting to normal conductor transition uh, for this uh, approach. And um, by using this one, you can uh, achieve fairly high energy resolution. And not why this one is made for MEVs, typically for normal X-rays. This is done in the, uh, in the thin film technology, so you can actually grow this as a whole array. The challenge is uh, this, it's the typical operational temperature of such devices is 80 millikelvins absolute. Means that if my, this is my detector, I need to shield it one, two, three times, uh, then put a vacuum jacket around it to actually be able to operate it in the lab. This can be done, that's a photo of my lab, that's my detector, that's my X, my source, my plasma source, and that's my interaction range, my lab setup. Nice. You can use this type of detection, this type of spectroscopy, the same detector or the same kind of detector used for, this is soft X-ray energies from the 400 EV range. This is what I call tender sulfur emission, for example, which is in the two and a half keV range. This is hard X-ray emission down in the seven, uh, seven kilo electron range. And this is X-ray absorption spectroscopy, now done time resolved pump probe, done in a lab with this plasma source or with such a plasma source uh, taken with a microcalorimeter. The advantage of this compared to the detector before is very efficient. This is the total numbers of photons emitted from my source detected. So this is of the range of 1% or slightly below but half a percent range. Why this is still very, very good, we're going to come to the other technology now in a minute. So we have energy dispersive detectors, which are very sensitive. Typically, if it's a silicon drift or CCDs or germanium type, we have resolutions of about 100 EV at 6 keV, which is enough for XRF, but not enough for a really high science. We have cryogenic detectors, which are very efficient in this detection, have high resolution, are rather expensive as I come back in a second. Now, the third group is the one which is most likely to be used in the lab for high resolution spectroscopy, which would be wavelength dispersive spectrometers. The challenge is set by an optical spectroscopy. Uh, if you would use a classical grating, you would expect to have reflectivity of about 50% in total. And this means not just the one wavelengths which you really focus on, but all wavelengths are reflected and you can collect them. In crystals or in X-ray science, uh, there is a difference. The difference is that the angle of total reflection for optical light, for example, if this is metal, is, ne is nearly 100% is reflected. For X-rays, and now if you look, for example, on, uh, let's say, this curve, gold, one degree, uh, this is the reflectivity of a surface. And this reflected, uh, reflectivity is breaking in as soon as you really come into the X-ray range. With other words, if you wanted to build such a grating for X-rays, you would need to do this with incoming angles of 0.5 degrees of an area which is 
significant, uh, very big, very large. And then the layer proportion or the quality you would need to make this grating of is single atomic layers over a very large range. It has been tried, but it's not something which is typically available. The way around it is to use crystals, crystal reflectivity. Again, we have discussed this already in my previous talk, that there are certain angles for each wavelength, one angle, where you come in and you have a very high reflectivity or very high diffraction. The interesting thing is that uh, for uh, if you come in with one energy, uh, this angle in which this one is reflected is very, very narrow. And the difference in contrast to the grating is that all other wavelengths which come at exactly the same angle are not reflected in a different direction, but are absorbed. Means the efficiency of such a grating is very interesting. If you look, for example, on a flat crystal, take a source, one geometry, and assume a typical reflectivity, now assuming that there's uh, crystal stress in the different, uh, not perf absolute perfect crystal, but as close as possible to perfect, um, then we get a reflectivity checking just the angle of acceptance of something of 10 to the minus seven. That means that this is the energy which is reflected. Now, there are ways around it. One way around it, for example, to use cylindrical band crystals in so-called von Hammer's geometry, where we use an, uh, an cylindrical band crystal where each band of this part is now again in Bragg condition and is refocusing the light onto uh, its spot. So one wavelength is actually diffracted from a bigger area. This is significantly increasing the efficiency. This approach is nowadays used in most large scale facilities. This is a, a photo from the uh, LCLS in Stanford, where we use 16 of those cylindrical band crystals. This is from Sakla in, uh, in uh, Japan. He has six uh, cylindrical band crystals. They are roughly of the order of three centimeters times 10 centimeters, sometimes a bit bigger, sometimes a bit smaller. Now the advantage is that you have for each wavelength a zone, which is reflective, and you can reflect many wavelengths at the same time. So in one dimension, they are focused. In the second dimension, this is dispersive. A second geometry which you can use to amplify or increase your efficiency is cylindrical, sorry, not cylindrical, it's a spherically bent uh, crystal where you refocus one point onto another point using slits, for example, to control and shield. The challenge is that you need to move now this crystal for each wavelength, so you need to scan it. That means we have to have motor control. Again, that's, uh, the efficiency is significantly increased because now you have a big area which is reflecting. You come something of the order of 10 to the minus four. Again, in, in certain facilities, that's from the ESRF, uh, big areas of, uh, uh, of crystals are made and many of those crystals are combined. There are even commercial instruments available for the lab where, for example, one of those crystals is put in a geometry. This motor movements of the scanning of the rockings is provided. And uh, Jerry Seidler, for example, has a commercial product or provides a commercial product. And, and this YouTube movie, for example, is from a, a separate uh, seminar series where he shows a little bit what you can do with this in the lab. Now, how does this all link to lab-based spectroscopy? Well, the point is that if you want to do lab-based uh, spectroscopy, you need to collect a certain numbers of photons in a certain band range. And depending on your problem, there is, the numbers are different. Now let's go through the numbers. For steady state saints, you need something of the order of 10 to the six photons in whole spectrum, which we need to collect. For XAS, something of the order of 10 to the, min uh, 10 to the five photons, three times 10 to the five. These, number, these plots and bars here are for different concentrations and really made for pump probes, so for time result spectra. For steady state, it's a little bit better, but these are the typical numbers you would need for a steady state. I need to point out that this is done or calculations are done for very high concentrations. So this is done for 100 millimole. Now, how does this link? Well, our source produces something of the order of 10 to the five photons per second. Um, if you look on the numbers for um, what the crystal, for example, cylindrical crystal can produce or can transmit, this gives you a count rate of something of 100 photons per second. 
spherical band crystal, something of 80 photons per second. For XAS, applying all of those numbers, you get something of the order of 10 to the 6 from the source. And you can collect uh, 30 photons per second or 10 photons per second um, from uh, such a setup. Uh, with a microcolorometer, it's a superconducting. We have a constant part of 5,000. That means combining the two, you need roughly three hours in the lab, one to three hours for a high concentration sample to do exanes or an XAS spectrum. That uh, sounds like a long time, but again, you can do this at any time. You can collect as long as you want. And if you design the spectrum properly, you can actually do fairly a lot of science with such a setup. Now, again, there's a number of two, three, four, five a factor, which is depending on the precise geometry and everything around it, but this is doable. Price, well, source is about three to five, to, uh, three to 20 kilo uh, kilo euros. A crystal, doesn't matter we, which of the two is of the order of seven. The detectors is around of the 20. So you can build such a setup for not too much money, or you can buy ready devices of about 100 kilo euros. If I compare to the numbers we actually needed for the proposal for running a, a large scale facility, this is comparable to a one beam time, two beam times running in your own lab. That's an interesting point. Of course, there is a limitation. The flux is significantly less, so you have to work with high concentration samples, but as preparation for the beam time, definitely a good option. Now let's go, let's say you have done all your pre-work, you have an interesting piece of science, you want to write a beam time proposal. For an effective beam time proposal, uh, there's, uh, I would like to use the template from the LCLS uh, because I really like the point, uh, the thought behind it. Uh, for a beam time proposal, number one is the scientific case. And for the scientific case, remember the amounts which is behind it is why is this proposal necessary? What does it bring us in the part? Why should you use this facility? And why couldn't you go anywhere else? And again, in this discussion, it's, uh, this is, has to be fairly uh, elaborate because it's a high value you, uh, you're actually producing. So think of it like a big grant. The second point, and this is something which I find really nice because I haven't seen this in many other templates, is it's very useful to formulate specific goals of an experiment. And meaning that you should formulate one or two clear scientific questions, which are suitable for a multi-day study. And this is again where the link to lab-based spectroscopy is. The lab can really help you of formulating those questions. Next point is experimental procedures and equipment. And these ones need to include how much sample you have, what are the conditions, what are the focus conditions of the beamline and pump conditions if you do pump probe spectroscopy. You have to consider the time, how long does it take, which needs to be uh, under the conditions at the beamline. For example, facilities have safety procedures. You have to go into and outside the hatch. You have to do remote control of certain conditions. So all of these things you have to consider. You have to also consider backup, uh, means if your sample is, for example, damaging this time, what are you doing? Is there, is, do you have alternative samples? Do you have alternative signs? Can you use standard conditions? For all of this, again, like the last time, talk to a beam line scientist. Contact them, discuss your experiment before, or use an experiment collaborator before you write the application. Not to neglect as a part of your proposal is your experimental team, who will do the analysis, who has the ability to prepare the samples and who will be at the beam time. If you're talking about teams of 10 plus people, this is not a simple question to answer. The last and most important question, which maybe is most confusing, is the technical feasibility. Technical feasibility. Number one, of course, talk to your beamline scientist. Because if you're running in standard conditions, if you're running a standard sample under standard concentrations, you can just use those standard conditions so you don't have to do the calculations. If you have to do the calculations yourself, or if you want to estimate how long does it take to do a measurements, this is what I will go into details now. For X-ray absorption spectroscopy, uh, 
the key is the height of the absorption or everything is relatively linked to the height of the absorption edge. Remember, if we, uh, ex uh, if we excite the sample, we can, as soon as we get the energy above the ionization potential, we can, uh, we have to see a rise in the absorption or a drop in the intensity, which goes through your sample, as you can see here, for example, this is an absorption edge and the height of this edge relative to the intensity you're sending in is the significant number which we use for all of the other normalizations. In the standard synchrotron, for example, these signals we're measuring here, the blue line would be what you measure before your sample, so incoming beam monochromized before your sample. This is what you measure after your sample, which goes through it, and this one is measured after your reference foil. Now for doing these calculations, how high those edges are, there's a lots of different software available. I personally use uh, Hephaestus, which is uh, described by Bruce, who wrote this program, a souped up periodic table for the X-ray spectroscopist. It's fairly powerful because you get not only the numbers of where the edges are or where your lines are, but you get also a lot of other parts of the program. Inside this program, this is a set of programs called Demeter. It also includes Athena, which is data pretreatment, or Artemis, which is used for fitting. And uh, I would like to point out a little commercial that I uh, will organize, or we will organize with links and workshop on how to do X-ray absorption spectroscopy analysis uh, next or in the coming spring. Now, with this program, I, for example, put in my sample, and then I can calculate is what would be the absorption of this sample through my experimental conditions. For example, here I'm running a liquid jet of 300 microns. I choose an energy before the edge and I get how much of the sample is absorbing, which is mostly the absorption, the background absorption. I go after the edge, see the difference in absorption, and I put in my solvent as I run a sample in a solvent and uh, get the absorption of the solvent. And from this one, I can see how much is actually absorbed by my iron atom and how much is absorbed by everything else. So I can calculate how high are those edge jumps, how high are they in reality, so how many photons of the photons which are coming in do I absorb, how high is my signal. Now, since everything else is normalized in the analysis to this edge jump, this is a significant number. How high is your signal? Well, that's depending on what science you're doing. I'm doing Xanes, for example, and this is a recent paper uh, from my group where we used, for example, the pre-edge or changes of the pre-absorption edge, which is the direct transition into bound states. And we see a clear shift, a clear change of those edges. And I can normalize to the height of the edge jump, which is from here to here. I can estimate how high would this be, how big would my signal be. Calculating those spectra for Xanes is tough. Fingerprinting is easier. I would like to refer to this book, which gives an excellent guide, step-by-step -step introduction, how to do those estimations. For X-ray emission, this is even a tick more, uh, even a tick harder. This information about how high is my edge absorption, how high is my total absorption is essential. You need to start with this part, but then you also need to know the fluorescence yields, of course, each absorbed photon, a certain fraction of those photons produces a fluorescence. For K-edge absorption, hard X-rays, this is on the, in the range of 30%. Now for iron, this is like in this case 35%. If you are in the soft X-ray range, uh, these emission yields are very low. Now this is in the per mil, one per thousand range. And uh, uh, But again, if you know how many photons you absorb, you have the yield, you know how many photons you emit. And then you can go back to the uh, information which we discussed here, how many photons you emit, combine it with how many photons you can detect, what is your signal, what is your accumulation time, what is your preparation time. Softwares which help for X-ray emission, I can recommend uh, PyMCA. Again, there's a whole bunch of different softwares. I've written one myself where you can put in your numbers and uh, get out how many photons will you collect from your sample per time. So what is your feasibility of your experiments?
sources for further reading parts. This is the same page I've shown before. I can highly recommend for XA absorption spectroscopy uh, this book. The other books are also giving a very good introduction into the samples and into the different techniques. Last but not least, lots of my work, all of my work is done in big collaborations with lots of people. Only in Lund, this is a very long list and uh, I don't really have the chance of, of uh, raising certain names, but uh, everybody here be thanked for all the collaboration and for the long time uh, of uh, collaborative work. And uh, I'm looking forward to doing a lot of more interesting science with all of my colleagues. That's all I had to say. I hope I have given a little bit of an introduction on how to do lab-based spectroscopy, what can you do in the lab, what you have to consider, where you find extra information, and if you then choose, and if you have the information behind how big is my signal, what would you need to do for writing a compelling proposal, and actually how important it is to really put all of those informations inside your proposal. Thank you for your attention, and I open for questions. Thank you very much, Jensen. Uh, we really want to thank you for this great contribution. So, and also our audience. And uh, so we have uh, some people today live with us. And I would say that we will not record this part. So if people would like to turn on their cameras and address directly questions to the speaker, please feel, feel free to do it. Um, because that, today it's a really like a privilege that we have uh, since we have a limited amount of audience uh, to have the chance to, to directly talk to our speaker. Uh, we can actually Yeah, they can, uh, uh, they can unmute themselves. Yeah, we allowed you all guys from the audience uh, to turn on your audio and uh, to directly ask questions to our speaker today. Uh, also to unmute them yourself, yes. <clears throat> okay. There are not many, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, I have a uh, quick question, general one. Uh, so, uh, if someone wants to do experiment at uh, your lab, how can they approach you or uh, I mean, there's no proposal writing for your lab, right? No. <laughs> yeah. No. <I'm laughs> yeah. Well, officially, you can actually write a proposal because you're part of the Laser Lab Europe. So there is an, uh, uh, the Lund Laser Center, there's a proposal procedure, and this is possible. But the uh, easiest way is simply to write me an email. And uh, also, after my last talk, I have been in contact with a lot of uh, the audience, or quite a few of the audience discussing a, a bit of the science. And again, this uh, is always open. So uh, in my own lab, I have mostly my microcalorimeter and uh, the two uh, lab, two different sources. One is a microfocus source, one is a laser plasma source. Uh, there is of course a limited possibility or limited experiments are possible. So one has to design, one has to discuss it, but exactly that's the uh, interesting part is uh, if you contact me, we can discuss the science. And uh, as I'm not a facility, uh, this is also a very open discussion. Um, this is the same as with uh, all the facilities, and I really recommend this also. Uh, even if you have, if you have a small science, uh, small bits of preparation experiments, um, all of the beamline scientists do the same as as I do. Is that uh, people can contact, we can talk, and we can find. Uh, ways of how to uh, make test experiments. Uh, in my lab, it's about contacting me, uh, talk about your science, and uh, if you both find a uh, feasible and practical uh, approach and experiment, I'm happy to do it. Um, this is, of course, done with uh, covered since we're not a user facility. Mm. Okay. Okay. And uh, but I can really recommend to 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 look on the uh, on the uh, uh, in the uh, necessities of doing experiments in your own lab, because the investment is fairly small, yes. and uh, it's not just feasibility for beamlines uh, or for experiments, but it's also training, because you train of course your students, you train yourself, 
and to prepare yourself for uh, also the analysis. And uh, a lot of those experiments can be done on a fairly low budget. Yeah, that's really important that you pointed yeah. this out, especially for a young scientist that approach these new techniques rather than going to the more advanced yeah. and uh, high yeah. cost uh, facility. Then to have these chances really important. Yeah. So I have one small question. It's more on the technical side. So uh, probably I missed it also. How is the dam radiation damage compared uh, to the synchrotron source and the tabletop source? That's a very good question, actually, um, because uh, the flux of the sources. So depending where you're working at the flux range, but the total flux you're putting onto the sample is uh, several orders of magnitude smaller. Mm -hmm. So depending depending how you define it, uh, but if I, for example, take uh, a sealed microfocus source, or mine is not microfocus, but it's still a very small source, the total numbers of photons I'm putting on my sample per time unit is very small. Um, it's also distributed over a wide range. Now it's depending how do I design my setup. For example, if you're working on iron as a sample, choosing a source where this emission line is close or just above iron, so you produce a lot of uh, light which you're uh, which you're generating photons, that's of course an, uh, uh, a benefit. If you, for example, work on sulfur, I would use some softer X-ray lines. Um, at the end of the day, um, the total numbers of photons you're putting on your sample is uh, of course the same or similar to what you do at the synchrotron. Uh -huh. Because you need you need numbers of photons to do get the same signal of noise, right? The difference is what type of photons, what quality of photons do you put on your sample? In a lab-based, you put a broadband. On a synchrotron, you typically, and I can switch back to this slide. Uh, I don't know if I can actually go backwards. Yes. So on a synchrotron, this is the underlayer output. So this is the photons you're putting onto your sample. Uh, coming from an undulator. Yes. Um, if you slice out monochromatic, if you do monochromatic experiments, then all the photons you're putting on your sample are the photons you're using. If you do broadband spectroscopy, uh, we can actually use the same slide, uh, use broadband spectroscopy, then not all photons are contributing to your signal. So sample damage is a consideration. On the other hand, uh, in a synchrotron, often, photons are focused. And if you have to focus, if you have to work with focused uh, beams, you have a high damage density. Um, and I don't have this slide back, but uh, you typically see even that you might burn a black, uh, a black spot on your sample. Yeah. In a lab-based setup, uh, it's depending how is your geometry. Because if you work with focused X-rays and focus them on a spot, you might actually put even more photons on this spot. Um, than you would do in a, in a, in a synchrotron. Um, but I, for example, I work a lot for X-ray emission spectroscopy. I used unfocused beam. I, my beam exposure range is three millimeters, four millimeter, big area. And that's why I use energy dispersive detection system because I do not need to refocus. I don't need these spatial constraints. Mm -hmm. On the other side, I count photons. So mm -hmm. I... I'm well aware how many photons do I need for my science. So the likelihood that I put too many photons on my samples is also a bit reduced because I'm careful. Uh, at the synchrotron, when you run with a lot of flux, that's not always the case. Yeah. Of course, you could try, you can try this, but there's the biggest difference. At a synchrotron, you get time. You get one day, two days, three days of experiments or sometimes only hours, and you have to produce it in time. So the time pressure is actually one, I found the limitation because um, it doesn't allow me to play. It doesn't allow me to put doses to play until when is it good enough? So I have a time pressure in which one I can do my experiment. So it's not as easy to answer the question. There's a lot of thought behind it, but uh, the advantage that you can play at home has certain points which are useful. Yes, true. Okay, 
thank you very much for your detailed answer. It's really, yeah, it's a bit long, but <laughs> no, it's really a pleasure to, to attend your webinars because you're really detailed, and I, I really appreciate your contribution. Anyone in the audience uh, that would like to address questions to our speaker, please don't be shy. Take your chance. I, mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, I my name is Lucy. Thank you for the webinar. It was really informative. Um, I am not a physicist. I am a chemical engineer, and I got introduced to synchrotron last year through my supervisor. And I have been to Max 4, I've been to um, DSIC in Germany as well. Um, my question is, for someone like me that have not had any previous experience or knowledge about this, um, how can I get materials? Because you talked about your previous lectures or um, webinars, because I mean, I could follow a bit, but I mean, a lot is still very confusing to me. <laughs> so if I could, I mean, some material that, that could take me from the very beginning so I can understand step by step how, what this is about and most importantly, how to analyze the result because I have tons of spectra that I don't know what to do with them, even though I've plotted them. So yeah, I just need help with this. <laughs> So in, in short, uh, for first, uh, in my division, we're offering a spectroscopy course. Okay. Where there is uh, uh, one week of uh, X-ray spectroscopy, a part of it. Uh, as a second, uh, we will organize, uh, this is part of links actually, uh, we will organize a uh, one week uh, summer school okay. uh, in uh, the coming spring, which is focused, this year will be focused on Xanes and Exafs as a part. This is in collaboration with Max4, with uh, uh, Kaiser, for example, uh, and part of the of our Lynx theme. And this is, I think, would be for your problem an excellent resource uh, for learning how to uh, analyze data, because that's exactly what the point is. Yeah. Um, last but not least, uh, the, I will also organize for myself in Lund, this is a, a course which, and it's, I'm sorry, the web, uh, the uh, uh, course from Lynx will be online. So okay. this can you can join from wherever you are. Um, if you're in Lund, there will be a uh, data analysis course in January, which oh, is nice. in general data analysis, not X-ray data analysis. But uh, uh, since I do uh, I do the course, um, there will be, of course be examples from data analysis. Uh, but this is maybe not uh, not the fastest way. This is really focused on Python. And uh, last uh, is I can really recommend for Xanes. If you have measured Xanes data, I can recommend this book because uh, this book goes from absolute zero, step by step in how to analyze it, how to uh, pre-treat the data, how to extract the data, how to prepare your samples. So for XAFs or for X-ray absorption spectroscopy, there is a book for XAS. To my knowledge, there is not. And this is why we also organize, or we plan to organize a second uh, summer school on XCS analysis and simulations. Um, when this will be is not quite clear yet, uh, but it's planned next year somewhere too. So in short, uh, I recommend the summer school if you're still in Lund next year, uh, in summer school next spring, or this book would give you, I think, the fastest way of really analyzing your data. Okay. Thank you very much, Jens, and thank you very much, Lucy. Do you yeah.